again. I'm also going to assume that your, your cosmology background is also largely based on what's, what's been covered in the last couple of weeks. So based largely on what Catherine Kress said and uh, what uh, George Ellis and Roy Martins have said in their talks. What I also want to do is I want to try and piece together some of the, the, the elements of the other talks, um, try and make connections, um, and also fill in some of the gaps, some of the questions that have been unanswered by George, Catherine, and Roy. But ultimate, ultimately what I want to focus on is the formation of structure in today's talk and, uh, and in the microwave background tomorrow. And if there's time, I also want to talk a bit about type 1A supernova and what they tell us about the, the current universe. So just to remind you what we're all doing um, and why we're doing it, essentially cosmology has very grand aims at tries to answer very fundamental questions, and some of these questions have been dealt with by many people at the school, the really fundamental questions about, about whether the universe um, had a beginning, uh, what the nature of that beginning was, the kind of questions that string theory are, are trying to address, um, what the origin of matter in the universe is, um, what the ultimate fate is that will be linked in with what I will talk about in connection with type 1a supernova, and of course, um, in some sense, a philo philosophical preference that we impose on our models that, in some sense, the location, our location in space and time is not privileged. So these are the kind of questions that cosmologists try and answer. And uh, in George's lectures, he talked a lot about foundations. He talked about uh, basic cosmological models. And, of course, we assume... Um, an underlying theory of gravity, and that theory, theory of gravity is based on these very beautiful equations, the Einstein field equations, and you would have seen them, like see them over there in the previous talk. Uh, but I think it's worth emphasizing to all of you students that cosmology is a synthesis, or modern cosmology, cosmology today is a synthesis of many different things. And to succeed in cosmology, you have to be a bit of an all-rounder. You need to know something about hydrodynamics. You need to know something about particle and nuclear physics. You need to know some quantum mechanics. And, of course, today, computational techniques are key in basically linking theory to the observations. So I think that's worth taking away, that if you want to move into cosmology, and indeed many other branches of physics, the bigger your toolbox, the more successful you'll be. Now, just to mention some of the triumphs, these have been mentioned before by Catherine in particular and, and George and, and Roy. Of course, Friedman found a solution which in, is incredibly simple, describes a homogeneous and isotropic universe. And uh, this model was confirmed by observations by Edwin Hubble back in the early 1900s. And uh, essentially, the Big Bang Theory is based on some key fundamental pillars. And I know Catherine mentioned these things. If anyone asks you, you know, to, in some sense, justify the Big Bang Theory, what you, ha what you have to mention are the abundances of the light elements, the microwave background, um, and the fact that the universe is expanding. Those are the three fundamental pillars. And uh, Catherine spoke um, very nicely about, about that. Now, the model itself is mathematically incredibly simple. And you would have seen the Friedman equation probably in two or three different forms. I've written it down here in a third form where I've basically written things in terms of the cosmological scale factor. So if you remember the Hubble parameter, which George defined as just the ratio of, if you like, a velocity, the velocity of the scale factor A divided by A, and I've just basically written, usually the Friedman equation is written in terms of H. Um, I've written it in terms of A here. And the reason why I've done that is that you can start to see connections with ordinary classical dynamics. So basically, just to summarize the Friedman, put the Friedman model in, in, in a simple nutshell, essentially, large-scale cosmology is governed by two equations, the Friedman equation, 
and the energy conservation equation or continuity equation and by essentially two parameters. It's the, the curvature, whether the universe is open, flat, or curved, and the kind of matter that the universe is filled with, so the equation of state. Usually the equation of state uh, is defined in terms of the pressure and the energy density. So the equation you'll often see in cosmology textbooks is that uh, the pressure is gamma minus 1 rho, and non-relativistic uh, matter, of course, corresponds to where the pressure is negligible. And um, amazing, and it tells you that your battery is recharged. Um, and uh, gamma is four-thirds is, in some sense, the other important value of gamma that corresponds to radiation. So basically, Friedman is very, very simple. K is the curvature. Of course, there's a third parameter, which I haven't mentioned, um, of course, lambda. But you can always put, push lambda into the matter. In, in other words, the right-hand side of the field equations. And uh, essentially, you can, you can then define an equation of state for, for lambda. So really, you can describe Friedman with just two parameters. And uh, if you integrate the conservation equation um, and then put it back in, you'll notice that the Friedman equation looks remarkably like the kind of problems that you did in first year classical dynamics. So I don't know whether George mentioned this to, to you, but basically in an, you, can, you, can, you can analyze the whole class of Friedman models by just uh, linking it to... Uh, the, 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 well, forming an analogy with a particle moving in a one-dimensional potential well. And that potential well is just a function of the scale factor, and you can plot that function. Uh, of course, it will depend critically on the value of gamma and also whether or not you have a cosmological constant. But you can plot the, the, uh, the potential, and then you can imagine a particle rolling in that potential well and and try and understand something about the dynamics, the dynamics of the scale factor, and that basically tells you the dynamics of the expansion. So what will be fun for you guys to do is, in fact, take that potential, take different values of gamma, and notice there's a critical value at uh, gamma is two-thirds, and uh, see whether you can determine all the possible evolutions that can exist within a Friedman context. And you can do that entirely pictorially. You can just imagine, you can just, uh, without integrating any equations, you can determine all the dynamics. So that's something which I would like you to try um, over the next couple of days in the workshop that's coming up. So that's basically Friedman in a, in, a, in a nutshell. Now, of course, various failings of the Big Bang Theory have been mentioned in lectures here. And of course, one of the failings is it doesn't really explain why the universe is so uniform on all scales and uh, doesn't explain the so-called horizon and flatness problems. I don't want to go into these problems again today because I know that Roy Martins discussed them in detail. And uh, more importantly, from the point of this talk, it doesn't really explain the origin of structure. So it doesn't explain, first of all, what physical process gave rise to the fluctuations, the initial fluctuations. Um, it doesn't explain why or how the fluctuations get produced on all scales. We see large-scale structure on all uh, cosmological scales. And um, it doesn't tell you how these fluctuations evolve. So we need to add something to the, the Friedman picture, which is homogeneous and isotropic, to be able to explain all of these things. I think Roy would have mentioned a little bit about the the origin of fluctuations um, through quantum, mecha quantum mechanical fluctuations in the very early universe. Um, but he probably didn't say much about how these fluctuations then grow into galaxies. And even when you have a gravitational instability picture, even when you, when you add this additional structure to the theory, as you'll see in the rest of the talk, there's still a problem in many of the simple uh, descriptions that there isn't enough time for this large-scale structure to evolve. So you need something in addition to the gravitational instability picture to make everything work.
So these are some of the things that I want to mention uh, today, and then I'll try and link the fluctuations to an observable, which will be the microwave background. So as Roy mentioned, um, the solution to some of the problems, of course, is inflation. So inflation will solve your horizon and flatness problem. And it will also provide a mechanism taking your small fluctuations and stretching them, making them cosmological in size. And it will also explain why the microwave background is so incredibly isotropic um, and in, in some sense independent on where you look in the sky. So these are the kind of things that Roy mentioned in his talk. And the structure formation problem is what I want to talk about um, for the rest of uh, this afternoon. Okay, let's get that. So just really to summarize the, the overall picture, if you like the evolution of the universe, we have a beginning, we have a big bang, which hopefully string theory will shed some light on. We have inflation providing a, a very neat mechanism for solving some of these cosmological, cosmological puzzles. And uh, then we have the microwave background. And of course, what we have there is an epoch. I'll say more about this tomorrow. But we have an epoch where prior to 300,000 years after the Big Bang, photons were very tightly coupled to baryons. And at about 300,000 years, photons decoupled and free streamed. And uh, carrying with them an imprint of the way the universe was, at that time, and that's going to be our key measurable, our key observable, telling us about the, the small fluctuations that uh, existed at that time and then how they link back to the initial conditions with, which were laid down at inflation and before. And then, of course, from um, just before that epoch and today, we have the period of galaxy formation, the period of formation of structure. So to, to the point we are at today, which is about 13.7 billion years. So that's more or less the history of the universe as we currently understand it. OK, so what I want to focus on is how we go beyond the Friedman model. So how do we add this additional mechanics to be able to understand how model how structure uh, formed in the early universe. So the goal today and tomorrow will be to find this mechanism, the structure, and then to link it to the deviations, the small variations in the microwave background. Now, there are many ways of doing this, um, some harder than others, but basically we have our underlying theory of of gravity is the Einstein is, is, is general relativity based on the Einstein field equations. So essentially what we're trying to find is a, is a solution, a reasonable solution, which is expanding and satisfies all the constraints imposed to us from the observations, which is a solution of the Einstein field equations. Now, there are a number of possible approaches. We could, in, in the sort of take the classical GR approach and say, well, let's try and find an exact solution of the field equations, like the Friedman model. The Friedman model is an exact solution. Uh, the problem is it's too simple. Let's find an exact solution which is more complicated, which is inhomogeneous and anisotropic, um, and therefore gives us the kind of structures that we see today. That's one possible approach, and there are such inhomogeneous solutions, for example, the lemaitre tolman bondi solution that are inhomogeneous. The trouble with this particular example, um, the LTB model, is that it's directly symmetric, so it favors uh, an observer at the center, the center of symmetry. So it basically violates the cosmological principle that we don't live in a preferred location in space and time. So the LTB model turns out to be incredibly useful for looking at say, a cluster of galaxies, so lo looking at a distribution of, um, of inhomogeneity, but it's not a particularly good model for describing cosmology as a whole. So that's uh, one possible route. The trouble with that route is finding exact solutions to the Einstein field equations is very difficult. 
And anyone who's studied general relativity and has read books about techniques for solving the atom field equations will know this. Um, it's extremely, it's a very hard, it's almost a field in its own right. The other approach is to look at what the observations tell us. Well, the observations tell us that variations in the temperature um, at around 300,000 years after the Big Bang are about one part in 100,000. So delta T over T is about 10 to the minus 5. So that's telling us that these fluctuations are very small. And if, there are, if the fluctuations in the temperature are of that order, and since your matter fluctuations or your, your, your radiation fluctuations, your temperature fluctuations trace the matter perturbations, then you'd expect the matter perturbations to also have that, uh, that order of magnitude. And that seems to point you towards an approach which is based on perturbation theory. So instead of trying to find the exact solutions to the field equations, why not take the good old Friedman model and perturb it? So just look at linear perturbations of that model. And then throw away all terms which are, um, if you like, quadratic in your perturbation variables. And just keep those terms which are, have, have an order of about 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6. So that's essentially the approach that people take. They don't try and find exact solutions. Exact solutions are useful in a limited context like the LTB model, but in, in the context of trying to understand the evolution of perturbations from a sort of global perspective, linear perturbation theory um, is the way to go. Now, before I delve into perturbation theory, um, I should, in some sense, it's not a word of warning, but it, it's got a long history. Um, the first work, um, or first real work done in this context um, was by Lifshitz and Kalachnikov back, back in the 1940s. And cosmological perturbation theory was only really fully understa understood um, in about 1980. So it has a, about 40 years worth of um, hard work attached to it. But the ideas are very, very simple. The basic ideas are very, very simple. Now, what properties would we want this perturbation theory to have? Well, we, we want it to, to satisfy um, general covariance. So we want it, because we're basing it on general relativity, we want to basically have the equations in the same form, to have the same form in all coordinate systems. And critically, we also want to have the physical quantities that measure the perturbations, we want to have them take the same value in all coordinate systems. Now, anyone, again, who's spent time looking at GR will know about this coordinate freedom and will worry about it. So the covariant part, as I've mentioned before, are simply the Einstein field equations and the conservation equations. And uh, the simplistic approach and the naive approach would be to apply perturbation theory just as one applies it in any other branch of physics, and that is take a quantity, uh, which in GR would be either a matter perturbation in the matter or a perturbation in the curvature, and split it up into a background part, so in other words, which is a solution of the Friedman equation, and a small perturbation. And having done that, having defined perturbations like this for all quantities, the metric quantities and the matter quantities, you put them in the field equations, you turn a big handle, and you throw away all terms which are um, second order, which are of order delta Q squared and higher. That would be the simplistic approach um, that one, would, one, one could, could take in tackling this problem. And it's essentially the essence of the approach taken by people like Lifshitz and Klaknikov back in the 40s. The problem is that it doesn't, although you satisfy the first criteria, you don't satisfy the second criteria. So you have what is coined the problem of gauge invariance. And very simply, just to give you a, an idea of what the problem, uh, what, 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 how, how the problem arises, what you're doing in, perturb in, in perturbations of um, the Friedman model is you're having to compare the value of a, of a tensor field um, in the perturbed model with its value in the, in the background model. 
And of course, one has a lot of freedom. One has coordinate freedom in your back. One, one can perform a coordinate transformation in the background, and you can change the value of that tensor field in the background through a simple um, linear transformation. And then, of course, the perturbation will change because the comparison between the value in the background and the value in the perturbed model will change under that transformation. So if you have two such, if you have one such change, that will induce two perturbations. And then the question is, which is the correct answer? Which is the one which is physical? So the simple answer to this problem is to find objects, for example, that might vanish everywhere in your Robertson-Walker model, in your background model, because then the identification, the, the comparison with the perturbed model would make no difference. And ultimately what one looks for then are quantities which vanish in the Robertson-Walker model, and they are then automatically gauge invariant. So that's one possible solution to this problem. But I don't want to talk about it. It's a very technical subject. There's a lot of work now being done at uh, done looking at gauge invariance, not just at linear order, but at second order and higher order. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's interesting. It's an interesting area, but it's, uh, it's very mathematically technical, and I don't want to get into it today. What I'll do at the end of my lectures is I'll give people a list of references, so what you can do is you can go away and you can read up about these more technical issues in your own time. Okay, but in the end, um, the actual equations that govern the perturbations in the density, in other words, give you a, a, an idea about the gravitational instability problem, is very, very simple. Essentially, it boils down to a second-order partial differential equation. And this delta here, let me define it, delta is roughly um, the, the difference in your density divided by background value. So it's rho minus rho naught divided by rho naught. So this is a measure of the, the perturbation, the, the, the deviation of your density compared to its value in the background. And this quantity essentially saw, uh, satisfies an ordinary um, partial, second-order partial differential equation. And you'll see that the structure is, is simply that of a damped harmonic oscillator. It's roughly um, like a damped harmonic oscillator. Um, but it depends also critically on the equation of state, on gamma. So you'll get different solutions depending on the epoch you look at in the universe, whether it's radiation-dominated or matter-dominated. Um, but it's essentially a wave equation. The expansion term, the term involving the first derivative in delta, is a damping term. So if you were to throw away, if you were to, to essentially just... Uh, um, compare this to a damped harmonic oscillator. It has exactly the same structure. Um, there's a matter term. Okay, so if you were to throw away the matter term, you'd just have a damped harmonic oscillator. This is just the, the usual Laplacian, uh, Laplacian term. This is a damping term. And uh, so basically the only difference between this equation and a damped harmonic oscillator is the fact you have a term proportional to rho. And that's a matter term. And uh, an important quantity um, that arises here is basically the propagation speed of your fluctuations. And that simply here is the sound speed. So what we're looking at here are just, we're just looking at a self-gravitating fluid. It's basically a fluid which is allowed to, in some sense, oscillate, undergo perturbations. But of course, there's gravity playing a role in this whole game as well. So not just pressure, but also gravity. So it's an interplay between pressure and gravity. But the structure is remarkably simple. So then the question is, well, can we try and understand this qualitatively? Of course, the simple thing to do would be to try and find exact solutions to this equation. One can always do that. But it's useful also to look at this equation from a, from a qualitative point of view.
And the key thing to look at is, in fact, let me go back a minute. Um, just before I, I move on to that, the, the expansion, what the expansion will do, because it's a damping term, it basically will smooth out your fluctuations. So what uh, we want to focus on, really, is the interplay or the, the relationship between the matter term and the divergence or pressure term. So basically, the matter term is gravity, and the divergence term is pressure. So it's going to be an interplay. The, di the dynamics of your fluctuations are going to be determined by by how the matter and divergence or pressure terms relate. Now, like all partial differential equations, um, the approach to take is to expand, to expand in terms of plane waves. So it has that structure. We just expand things in terms of harmonics. We take a, uh, a, a plane wave basis. And that will define for, will define for us a scale. And we define that scale to be co-moving with the expansion. So it scales with A. Otherwise, it has exactly the same structure as um, wavelength form would define for an ordinary spring, 2 pi divided by the wave number. The difference here is that we want to look at scales which are co-moving with the expansion. And these scales will represent uh, galaxy size fluctuations, cluster size fluctuations, and super, super cluster sized fluctuations, for example. So we simply expand the equation in terms of these harmonics. But before we do that, let's look at a very simple case. And if you go back to the original equation, you'll see that if the pressure, if you look at a non relativistic situation where the pressure is negligible, then the sound speed will be negligible, and then the divergence term, the Laplacian term, can be thrown away. And then you end up with an ordinary differential equation. So, so that's a, a very nice, nice example to look at before you try and look at the general situation. So in an era where you have matter, matter dominating, dominating, so um, what you do is you throw away the divergence term. You solve the Friedman equation, so the energy conservation equation and the Friedman equation. That tells you what the Hubble parameter is, it tells you what the density is. You put those into the coefficients of that equation, and you solve that equation, and you find a very famous solution, first written down by Lifshitz and Klaknikov. You find basically a growing mode, goes like t to the two-thirds, and uh, a decaying mode. And that solution essentially tells you that um, if you throw away your pressure term, so in other words, you throw away um, your restoring force, then what happens is that your fluctuation will grow. Gravity will dominate, and your density fluctuation will grow. And that really is the prediction of the famous gravitational instability. So this will tell you that if you have a gravitating fluid, you will end up with a, in a non-relativistic situation, you'll end up with a solution that grows. But of course, the universe is much more complicated than this. We don't just have matter. We don't just have baryons. We have other species. We have radiation. We have dark matter. Uh, we might even have quintessence. So the real situation is, of course, a lot more complicated. But the essence of the problem can be described in this way. It's remarkably simple. So in general, we have a mixture. We have a mixture. Let's keep things simple. Let's just consider baryons and radiation. And uh, so we have pressure. And because the universe is evolving, um, the equation of state will change. In the very early universe, the model will be dominated by radiation. So gamma will go like 4 thirds. And the late universe, it'll be dominated by matter or by baryons, say, and the universe, well, the, the equation of state will uh, be gamma equal to 1. So the pressure will be negligible. So, but it's a dynamical problem. Gamma will, and the speed of sound will vary from one epoch to the next. And um, as I mentioned, the, the dynamics will then be determined by which terms dominate 
in this simple differential equation. And uh, most importantly, which term, the matter term or the divergence term, which, which of those terms dominate? So first thing to do, of course, is to expand in terms of these plane, plane wave eigenfunctions. And you then basically get uh, an equation for your modes. And you can then just make a simple comparison between your matter term and your divergence term. And you can say, well, which term, um, for which term um, will dominate over the other? And then what is the physical consequence of that? So gravitational collapse will clearly occur if your matter term dominates your pressure term. Okay. Your gravitational term, the term which is, which is uh, given to you by gravity, will, if that dominates over the, the divergence term, then you have gravitational collapse. And if the divergence term or the pressure term dominates, then you have oscillations. You have acoustic oscillations which are damped by the expansion. So you can basically write down a criteria for gravitational collapse. You can ask the question, on what scale, what's, what is the important scale corresponding to, to gravitational collapse when you have a gravitating fluid? And this, those of you who study some fluid mechanics will know this to be just the genes criteria. Except this is now written down in the context of um, a, a fluid um, moving under the influence of gravity um, described by general relativity rather than Newtonian mechanics. And the critical wavelength um, you can basically solve that. You can solve that uh, inequality. You can work out a critical wave number, and from that critical wave number, you can get a critical scale. And that critical scale is the gene scale. And from the point of view of looking at the qualitative behavior of the perturbation dynamics, that is the, probably the most important scale um, in the analysis. Um, so, for example, if you look at the matter-dominated era where your equation of state is roughly equal to 1, then you can work out the, the gene scale and the, cor and the corresponding mass, which is basically just the density times the scale cubed. And of course, it's the mass which is going to be very important in terms of determining the kind of object that you're looking at, whether it's a cluster of galaxies or whether it's a supercluster of galaxies. Okay. Now let me run through an example of a possible evolution for a given scale. So as Roy described in his talks, your perturbations are seeded in the early universe. So you have your quantum fluctuations, these fluctuations are then stretched, they're made super horizon sized, and then at some later point in time they will re-enter the Hubble radius and um, they, will, they will then correspond to different, the different structures that we see today. And as I mentioned before, the kind of scales that we're looking at here are co-moving wavelengths, so basically they are fixed into the expansion. So really what we have is a fixed scale, and what's evolving here is the, the genes scale in comparison to that physical scale. So in the radiation-dominated era, you can work it out, and you find that the gene scale grows linearly. It grows up to a maximum value at the point of time where matter and radiation, the, the relative amounts of matter and radiation become the same. So at matter-radiation equality, um, the gene's scale will, will reach a maximum value, and then it remains reasonably constant until the point of time that the radiation decouples from matter. And then because you have a non-relativistic uh, non, non species dominating, then the speed of sound will tend to zero, and the gene scale will then um, fall off. So, and of course, for the gene scale, you can then compute a, a gene's mass. So what you should try and do, again, as an exercise, is see whether you can 
follow, you can follow the gene scale or the gene's mass through the evolution of the universe. Start in the radiation-dominated era and work out how it evolves as you go from radiation-dominated to matter-dominated. And what we want to do now is compare, is take a fixed co-moving scale and see what happens in comparison to the gene scale. So, for example, let's start with a trivial example. If you have a scale which is much bigger than the maximum value of the gene scale, so not this example on the slide, if you start with a scale much bigger, then basically it will grow unimpeded. Okay? It will never come inside the, the gene scale, and you'll never get any acoustic oscillation. You'll never, the pressure term will never dominate. If you have a scale which is um, less than the so-called silk scale, um, which has a corresponding mass, a silk mass, then during that, uh, on, on those scales, you have a lot of uh, small-scale um, damping physics going on, and your perturbations will be washed out. So basically, you have a region between this maximum value and the value corresponding to the, the silk scale. And the masses corresponding to those scales are roughly 10 to the 12 solar masses for the, the silk, the, 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 the mass associated, associated with, with the, the, the silk damping scale, and 10 to the 15 solar masses, which is the, the mass associated with the maximum value of the, the gene scale. So in that, in that band, you will have interesting physics taking place. So let's look at an example of a mode which is sitting in that band. So what happens um, is that you start off with a growing mode. You start off with, with uh, your scale, which is, which is um, smaller than your gene scale. So basically, the pressure can't play a role in the dynamics. And it basically grows. And in the, in, it, it grows basically linearly with, uh, with the, the cosmic time. Then, at some point, it will come in, it'll, it'll reach this, this, uh, this uh, the value of the, the, the gene scale. It'll come inside. And it then stops growing because what happens? The pressure starts to take over and you have acoustic oscillations. And these will last essentially until decoupling. What you have is a, a photon baryon fluid that undergoes acoustic oscillations. The point at which the, the photons decouple from the matter, then there's nothing to stop the matter from starting to grow again during the matter-dominated era, and it grows like t to the two-thirds, which is the famous solution that I derived on a previous slide. So that growth will carry on until the universe becomes curvature-dominant. So that's the, the, the essential picture we have. Um, so if you just think in terms of numbers here, um, 10 to the 12 solar masses that corresponds more or less to a rich cluster of galaxies. So that's your minimum scale, and 10 to the 15 solar masses might be a supercluster. So basically, these are the, exactly the physical scales that we see in the universe today. So just to summarize, there are some key times, clearly. There's a time where your scale becomes smaller than the gene scale. So that's when the pressure starts to take over. Then, of course, the next time, which is important, is when the matter-dominated era begins. In other words, when the radiation, the amount of radiation, the amount of matter are the same, and the, radi the matter-dominated era be begins. And then, finally, the, the next uh, time, which is really important, is decoupling. So when the photons decouple from, from matter and start to restream. And uh, there's a problem with the picture I've described. And that is that this is, this, this is a picture based entirely on baryons and photons. 
And if you do the analysis, although this, this picture works remarkably well and it gives you the kind of structures, the kind of scales that are relevant, if you do the, the detailed analysis, what you find is that there simply isn't enough time for the structure to form. And taking that back to the microwave background constraints, what you've, for that's telling you the size of the fluctuations at 300,000 years after the Big Bang, what you find is your fluctuations are three orders of magnitude bigger than what we observe. So there's a problem with the simple baryon and radiation picture, although it, from a qualitative point of view, gives you a very good starting point. So what do you have to throw in to make things work? What you throw in is cold dark matter. Now, cold dark matter doesn't couple to very, to, to, certainly doesn't couple to radiation. And so what happens is your cold dark matter starts to grow much earlier. And what it does, it sets up little potential wells for your baryonic matter to fall into. So it speeds the, the whole structure formation scenario up. So if you have a universe dominated by cold dark matter, then you can basically get around the problem that exists within this very simple baryon radiation model that I've described. So just to finish up today's lecture, let me show you a picture. This is just a numerical integration of all the different components, different fluctuations in the, in the model. And you can see here that the, the dark matter component is this line here. And you can see it basically grows and doesn't feel any, does, is it, because it's not coupled to the radiation, it doesn't feel the pressure, and it just continues to grow. Your matter fluctuations, because they obey the same equation of state, they, they follow the same evolution at early times, but because they're coupled to radiation, they then, at the point of time, they come inside this critical scale, they undergo acoustic oscillations, and then at this point, the baryons decouple from, the radiation decouples from baryons, and the, the t to the two-thirds growth that we derived uh, starts to kick in. And then the, you have a damping tail for the radiation. Basically, small-scale physics kicks in and damps out the, the fluctuations in the radiation. So this is the, the detailed numerical analysis of the, of the problem. But we were able to, in a, very, in a very simple way, get many of the qualitative features of this by just looking at the partial differential equation and comparing scales, just by looking at different terms and asking questions about which terms dominate and what the important scales are. So you can get a lot of the qualitative analysis by not having to solve the much more detailed problem numerically. And I think that's also important to take away. Rather, look at the equations and see whether you try and understand them in terms of qualitative techniques first before you go and write a big code to give you all the details because you'll learn a lot more, well, learn quite a lot by following the first approach before you follow the second approach. So I think I'll leave it here. And uh, tomorrow what I'll, what I'll start to talk about is how the fluctuations in the matter relate to fluctuations in the radiation, how we can use the microwave background as a tool for understanding the small fluctuations that existed at the time of decoupling, and then how they relate to models of the early universe. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Uh, um, a number of other people, but, uh, but there are many. There are many different models. Um, essentially, um, relics from that. that there are particles which exist in the, in the standard model of, of particle physics. No one is the, the problem with cold dark matter is that uh, no one has really seen. Direct, well, we've seen physical evidence of the dark matter. We've seen the evidence of dark matter, as Catherine described, in rotation curves of galaxies, but we haven't really got a very good physical handle in terms of we haven't actually measured 
any of this stuff. So we do have a problem from the point of view of a very good dynamical model where we can see the evidence of the dark matter, but we haven't actually got a very good physical understanding in that we, we've got detectors which are looking for dark matter, but we haven't actually seen any yet. So, um, so that's, that's in some sense one of the frustrations about modern cosmology in that we have an extremely detailed dynamical picture based on Einstein's theory of general relativity, based on fluid mechanics, based on, on plasma physics. Um, but we have, in order to make the Friedman model fit the data, we have to throw in as our, as our background model, if we want to choose our Friedman model as the model that describes the universe as a whole on, on very large scales, then we have to throw in a lot of um, matter components that we don't really have a good physical handle on, although we, have, we see dynamical evidence that it exists. So that's one of the problems that, that, that we face as cosmologists in, um, uh, at the current time. It's actually made much worse. I'll, I'll, in tomorrow's lecture, I'll talk about the, um, the, the dark energy. There we have an even bigger problem in that the dark energy um, dominates the matter density today, and we have absolutely no um, physical idea what it is. We have, we have theories, but we have no measurement, no actual physical measurements of this matter component. So again, one has to, one has to question the, um, the fitting of the Friedman model to the observations that we, that we are getting um, in, in, in very large amounts today. And uh, possibly in two or three years' time, uh, depending on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the outcome of the next range of observations, the, um, uh, the Planck satellite in particular, uh, possibly um, a supernova uh, telescope project that will look at the Type 1a supernova in a great deal of detail. We, we may well have to, to start to question the, the Friedman description of the large-scale evolution of the universe. So... Um, it's somewhat frustrating because we have this great dynamical picture, but we don't have a very good physical picture.